Hello everyone, welcome again. So again, we'll be looking at the industrial chemistry topic, which is an option topic for the year 12 chemistry syllabus. And in this lesson, we'll be looking at a review of chemical equilibrium. Because many industrial processes are of course not complete, or they don't go to completion. So we have to be able to manipulate chemical equilibrium so that we can get an advantage out of it. So here is an example of an equilibrium. As you can see, it's teetering very, very precariously, but it's, a, it's an example of, uh, of an equilibrium in which everything is sort of in balance. So many reactions in industrial chemistry are, of course, equilibrium reactions. So they don't go to completion. And equilibrium can be defined as a state where the macroscopic parameters of the system don't change. So what that means is that if I look at a, a system at chemical equilibrium, I won't see any changes happening in front of my eyes. I won't see any color change. I won't see heat or light being emitted. Everything stays the same. It, the molecules might still be moving on the inside and changing, but from the outside, I won't be able to see that. So if we look at this example here, if I can, it's at equilibrium when, I, when the faucet at the top is running at the same rate as the faucet at the bottom so that we have this level of water doesn't change so we can consider it chemical equal we can consider it an equilibrium even though there's water coming in and out it's still what we consider an equilibrium because the macroscopic details aren't changing so what it means is the forward and reverse reactions proceed at the same rate so if there's a reaction going one way and a reaction that kind of consumes that the products and goes back the other way, then they must happen at the same rate. So we have to look again at La Chatelier's principle, remembering that he was the guy that sort of developed our knowledge of equilibrium. So he's someone that we need to, his principle is something that we need to study. And even for the chemists, uh, the people that aren't chemists or studying other forms of science and as well economics and other things, this principle comes up all the time. In economics, it comes up with supply and demand. And in physics, it comes up in Lenz's law. So just think about that if you're studying any of those subjects. So his principle is essentially a way to predict how an equilibrium system will adapt to a change. And sort of quoted is, when a change is imposed on a system at equilibrium, that system will shift to minimize that change. So if you impart a change on an equilibrium system, that, sis, that equilibrium system will alter so that it will try to resist that change as much as possible. So the factors that affect equilibrium are temperature, pressure, or volume. Those two are related, so pressure and volume. And the concentration of the chemicals within that system. Okay. So let's look at temperature first. Remembering that temperature of the system essentially relates to how much energy is available to the system. So temperature is a measure, so to speak, of the energy of each molecule. So here, we can actually define, we can actually use the temperature as a way to measure the speed at which these molecules will be whizzing around in this container. And the more heat we impart, the faster they move. So if the temperature increases, the system will shift to absorb the energy in an endothermic reaction. So if we heat it up, like in this diagram here, the reaction that occurs will be the one that can absorb the most energy. And obviously, if you cool it, the opposite will happen. The reaction that releases more energy will be the one that is favored in that situation. So of course, the reverse will happen with an exothermic reaction. OK, so endothermic reactions will absorb energy if the temperature goes up. And if the temperature goes down, you'll see lots of exothermic reactions because they're trying to replace that energy. So pressure and volume. Because one mole of gas takes up a specific volume at a temperature and pressure, it means a particular thing. So changing the pressure and or volume will change the equilibrium, obviously. So if you look at this animation here, you see that there's a certain number of these nitrogen and hydrogen molecules. But then at the start. But then when we compress it, they shift in their composition, and we get more of these ammonia molecules. And that's what we mean by changing the pressure. By imparting more pressure on this system, we're trying to get it to take up less space. 
So what it does is it shifts, and you can see there's a change in the composition of that system. So increasing the pressure or reducing the volume, remembering they're sort of related to one another, will cause the equilibrium to shift to the smallest number of moles. Okay? So the total number of moles will always shift such that you always get the minimum number because one mole of gas takes up a defined amount of space. So the minimum number of moles will take up, of course, the minimum number of space. So this is what it's saying here. So an example of this is with our a harbor process, which we've studied in chemical monitoring and management. So the volume is decreased, but the pressure increases. And so the reactant to product ratio shifts so that there are fewer moles of gas present. So there's fewer moles or fewer total molecules um, simply because the pressure has increased. So the concentration of reactants and products also affects equilibrium. When the concentration of reactants and products change, the equilibrium will also change. So if more reactants or products are added, the equilibrium will shift so that it absorbs the new chemicals. So that they kind of, so if you increase one, the equilibrium will try to decrease that by absorbing them in a reverse or forward reaction. So if the chemicals are removed, the equilibrium will shift to replace those chemicals. So if we take them away, then the equilibrium will try and push more of those to replace them. So another reaction will take precedence. So here, same harbor process, but now we're increasing the number of nitrogen molecules, and all of a sudden we get more ammonia because we suddenly have more nitrogen, so it tries to absorb that nitrogen. So here we start with one, and then as we put in all these extra nitrogens, we end up with four. Okay, so that's, that's how equilibrium and concentration of reactants works. Okay, so that concludes our, lesson, our review of equilibrium. Hopefully you can remember all of these um, factors like temperature, pressure, volume, and the concentration. And hopefully you'll be able to apply La Chatelier's principle to other uh, systems. So let's move on to the, to the um, question segment. So which of the following, when changed, does not affect the chemical equilibrium? So pressure. So obviously that can't be right, because we know pressure affects the chemical equilibrium. Um, it shifts to the maximum or minimum number of moles, depending on whether you increase or decrease. The temperature. No, again, we talked about this. The temperature is a measure of the energy. And so it will shift the equilibrium such that you'll get absorption or emission of energy depending on whether you heat or cool it. D, the, present, the concentration of reactants and products. Again, that affects the concentration, uh, the equilibrium, simply because increasing the reactants will cause the equilibrium to try and absorb them. Or removing the reactants will try to get the equilibrium to replace them. So the last one is C, which is correct. The presence of a catalyst will only allow the system to reach the equilibrium faster. So it doesn't affect how much e what the equilibrium concentrations are. It simply just affects how fast it will get there. Okay. So moving on, question 10. The harbor process, which is this chemical reaction, is often performed under very high pressure. Justify the use of high pressure with reference to the equilibrium reaction. Okay. So justify is a sort of new one by us. And justify just means to set up an argument with evidence for that argument, OK? So increasing the pressure will shift the equilibrium to the right. And that's by La Chatelier's principle, as you can see. There are fewer moles of gas on this side compared to this side. There's four moles of gas on this side, but there's only two moles of gas on this side. So by increasing the pressure, we go to the minimum number of moles. So it would be obviously this side. Again, this is because the right-hand side of the equation has fewer moles of gas. By moving in that direction, it attempts to reverse the high pressure change. So because the gas sort of, there's less gas now, the pressure will sort of decrease because we've increased the pressure by compressing it somehow. And this will maximize the yield of ammonia 
thus justifying the use of such high pressure. Because we're trying to get a lot of ammonia out, remember? So we're trying to pressurize it so that we get the most ammonia out as possible. Okay. Now if that makes sense, we'll move on to question 11, which is explain the effect of adding hydrochloric acid to the solution with the equilibrium reaction Na plus plus Cl goes to form NaCl solid. Okay. So explain is cause and effect. So by adding hydrochloric acid to this system, what's going to happen? So we have this reaction. HCl goes to form H plus plus Cl minus. That's the first thing we need to know. By adding HCl, you are increasing the amount of Cl minus in the solution. Okay? So we're essentially increasing this. So what does that mean for equilibrium? It will shift to the right to absorb that excess Cl. Because we've put in more, the equilibrium wants to shift to absorb that extra Cl. So what you'll observe is you'll observe higher amounts of solid NaCl in your container or beaker. So because we're adding more of this, we'll see more of this come out. And that means that we will have more solid NaCl. So we should be able to see a noticeable difference in the NaCl solid. So moving on to question 12, if we consider this reaction, which is nitrogen, dinitrogen tetraoxide going to form two nitrogen dioxides, what would be the effect of increasing the pressure? The equilibrium will shift to the left because there are fewer moles of gas on the left. So as you can see, it'll go this way because there's fewer moles of gas. Part B, if the volume of the container were halved, which reaction would be favored, the forward one or the backward one? So remember, we're halving the volume. But if we halve the volume, what does that mean? It essentially increases the pressure because we're halving the amount of volume but keeping everything else the same. So again, it'll shift to the left because there's fewer moles of gas on this side, so it takes up less space. So as you can see, if we halve the volume, there's less space for these guys, so it'll split and form these guys because the, it takes up less space. So remembering halving the volume equates to increasing the pressure. Okay. So question 13. Consider this reaction now. It's methane plus water goes to form carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. So this is sometimes called syngas. So what is the effect of increasing the temperature of the system? Okay. And it's plus 251, so it's an endothermic reaction. So the forward reaction would be favored as it's endothermic and can utilize the increased amount of energy. So as you can see, by increasing the temperature, we go this way because it will try to absorb that increase in energy. So what is the effect of injecting H2 into the system? Well, the reverse reaction will be favored because it will try to absorb that H2 in order to counteract that change. Okay. So that concludes this summary of the, the chemical equilibrium. So we've talked about what factors affect chemical equilibrium and how we can sort of predict what our chemical system will do if we impose one of these changes. So there will be more advanced chemical equilibrium topics in the future. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Mm -hmm.